All right, well, just to welcome you all again, uh, my name is Lauren Hanahan. I'm one of the um, Arts Across the Curriculum Specialists from Missouri Alliance for Arts Education. Let's build our positive, brave space here. Um, while you're here with us today, I know we've got Halloween coming up. Like I said, I'm at parent-teacher conferences. Um, you know, there's a lot happening around us. So just kind of unplugging for this hour and being present in our conversation. Um, be open throughout. We never know when you're going to find that little nugget that you can take away with you. Um, it could be in a dialogue or a conversation. It could be um, in our warm-up. It could be through the presentation you hear today. Um, and then, as always, we encourage you to engage in whatever way you feel safe, um, whether that's uh, engaging through the chat option. We'll try to reiterate what you share there, um, but always feel free to just unmute yourself and share out with, with the group what you're thinking. Okay, now we're going to get started with our warm-up activity. This is called Watercolor Conversations. Um, if you were doing this in your class, you would want to use some watercolor paints, but like I said, it's not something we always just have right, right next to us. Um, but this is an activity you can use with students to build community, um, or if you're beginning stages of dialogue with students, how do you talk to somebody and listen to somebody, this is an interesting way to, to kind of build that um, perception with them. So what we're going to do, um, we're going to do the first part of this activity together just to warm up. And then I'll explain to you at the end how you would extend this in your classroom into a conversation. Um, but for right now, we're going to just start by um, looking at some artwork and noticing the lines and the shapes and the colors, because these are different elements that artists use to illustrate a feeling um, that they might have or an emotion they might have, even if it's an abstract or non-representational piece that isn't quite as obvious what we might get from that feeling. Um, looking at these elements are ways that we can kind of you know, use our creative thinking to problem solve what might they be trying to tell us. So we're going to take a look at a few examples um, and then just based off of the colors you see, the lines you see and shapes you see, you're going to use our sentence stem here, I think, because I see. So we're going to be talking about what kinds of emotions you might be feeling or thinking the artist is portraying. All right, let me give you an example. So using the sentence stem, I'm looking at the colors and I'm noticing the colors are brighter, right? So I might say, I think the artist is portraying happiness because I see bright pinks and bright greens and bright blues. So I'm taking those two pieces and putting them together into that thought. Let's take a look at the next one and see what thoughts you might have here. Looking at the lines and the shapes and the colors that the artist used, what do you think they might be portraying here? Okay, so Alice, I think itchy confusion because I see, what do you see that makes you say that? Because I see all the little squirrely squiggly lines that are kind of go in many directions and the little black figures make me think of ants or fleas. <laughs> Great. Any other thoughts on this one? I think the world is hidden by a veil and sometimes we can peer through. Ooh, what makes you say that? Well, there's all those emerging black shapes that are kind of like, look like they're they're blowing in some kind of a breeze or there's a little bit of movement there. And then, and then behind that is there's this diffuse kind of fuzzy uh, world that Maybe we can't see too clearly, but then all of a sudden, sometimes maybe we can. Interesting. We're on or behind it. Let's take a look at another one. Whoa. Here we go. <laughs> I think because I see, noticing lines, shapes, colors. I feel like the dark and mysterious ones we're all connecting with. <laughs> Any connections to this one? I think that sometimes we make mistakes, but often these mistakes uh, in the end turn out to uh, what we really should always be doing. I seem to have nature on my mind, <clears throat> but I'm a little, even though it's, <clears throat> excuse me, beautiful and kind of peaceful, but there's that really intense orange thing that makes me think as a wasp's nest. 
And I'm a little worried that that pinky round critter doesn't poke it and get stung. Mm. Okay. Some other friends in the chat said, I think of a school and a person getting a drink at a school water fountain and an apple and a fruit on a vine. I think of peacefulness because they see small shapes on a branch among a warm sky. Whimsical because of the floating hues, the semi-order of the arrangement of shapes. I think the artist is trying to portray simplicity because they see a person's own interpretation of something that we might not understand. Right, so even in those abstract non-representational pieces, we're still kind of feeling some sense of calmness or peacefulness or wondering or exploring. So we're still getting some kind of emotion and feeling out of it, just based off of the colors, lines, and shapes that these artists are choosing, not necessarily totally understanding what exactly it might be. So for the next part of this um, activity, you're gonna have three minutes. I'm gonna play some music in the background here. Um, and you're quietly just gonna check in with yourself. Where are you today and how are you feeling? What is your mood? Um, if your feeling, current feeling could be a color, what color would it be? What would represent that the best? Um, if you're feeling excitement, what kind of line or shape would you use? If you're frustrated, what would you do? Um, and so I'm just gonna give you a couple of minutes just to kind of, be in your own space, in your own world, um, and kind of show maybe how you're feeling um, as we start our day together. All right. Would anybody like to show their piece up on the screen? If you have your background blurred, I find you have to unblur it before you can hold it up. Um, but looking to see if anybody would like to share. And then we could use that same, I think, because I see STEM to see if we can figure out how you're feeling today. Rachel, I think you're feeling energized because I see some lines like all around the outside there that are making me think you're feeling energized. I think of possibilities and growing because it looks like a plant growing out of a pot in many directions. And the colors, the varied colors are also full of energy of some kind. Let's see, Phyllis, can we spotlight yours really quick? Take a look at Phyllis. Hmm. I was gonna say, I think Phyllis and I had similar days because we both have kind of the same swirly line quality. Yeah, there's something in like the middle of that purple swirl that's like drawing me in like, the eye of a hurricane or something like things might have been crazy around you but you're still centered in the middle of it <laughs> and you have very bold color choice too <laughs> any other thoughts how did it feel uh to participate in this activity well, I'll say even though you set us up to re to uh, be prepared for um, asking those questions, I I still wasn't prepared after I had created the work of art for to to do that. I think it's because of the internal shift from analysis and and taking information in to the creative process to going back. I just wasn't prepared for that shift, mm -hmm. but. Other than that, it was, I, I thought it was fun. <laughs> um, I think that obviously this is something we're doing in a few minutes that I'm guessing you would do over several days in a classroom, which would make it easier um, because um, I also, I actually have a, a question about emotion as one of the entry points. I think 
in some ways, for me at least, it's really good because that's how people will relate to a work of art. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like what it, what does it express or how does it make me feel kind of thing. But in another way, it almost, could it almost pull us back from going more deeply into an artwork and that maybe, you know, that you spend more time with line and color. I could have spent a long time with that and 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 deepen my seeing. Mm -hmm. And then I might be ready for a question about interpretation. So that would be a big, a big sort of open statement question that I'm I'm putting out there. Yeah, for sure. I think I think you made a good point, Alice, that this would definitely be something that extends over a longer period than just the, you know, 10 minutes that we had working on it together. Um, the extension off of that as well is just eventually students would be sitting across from each other with watercolor paints as the medium that they use for this. And one student would start a line or a shape. And then the next, the student across from them would have to you know, respond to that in some way. So they're sharing a paper. Um, it's not something you can erase, right? So it's building. The goal is to really feel emotions and be able to feel vulnerable in that space and learn how to communicate and go back and forth and share the space. So that's why we had that heavy focus on the artwork at the beginning and the emotional attachment. Whereas, you know, if our goal was a different goal and we're using art form as our, um, learning tool the questioning might be a little bit different depending on what your goal is so so for you is the emotion coming in the vulnerability of sharing and sitting across from each other is that is correct that, okay yeah yeah so the next part of it um you know this was us just kind of practicing our own vulnerability and, and sense of feeling where we're at um and then the extension piece to this would be that um, students would be having a conversation with each other through the artwork. Um, so they have to express their mood um, using the colors, lines, and shapes to have their feelings represented. Um, but similarly to a conversation, they're not going to start painting while the other person is painting. So they have to kind of listen to what that person is trying to say through their artwork, and then they're going to respond to that and build into it. And so it's it's this like nonverbal conversation and using that art form to build that trust between um, community members in your class. So it's definitely a big community building piece um, that you could use. Phyllis. I just wanted to comment about how valuable I thought hearing other perspectives were as well. It didn't really matter that whatever was said wasn't what I was thinking or what I had chosen to share. But as soon as someone shared an alternative perspective, um, it prompted me to be, to, to reflect on their words and then see if I could, could understand their point of view or their point of reference. And to me, that was just as valuable as any sort of taking turns pieces, that alternative perspective and opening dialogue and being being um, okay with divergent thinking, um, that there isn't just one correct answer, that we embrace all kinds of answers. Yeah, that leads me perfectly into the next segue, <laughs> um, because arts are a great piece to kind of build in multiple access points, right? And so you can come in at any level or any thought process or any feeling or emotion that you're having. Um, and so we really try to focus, you know, in Missouri Arts, we're working with getting arts across the curriculum, and that can look a lot of different ways. And our main focus for this um, group here is that arts integration piece. And so up on the screen right now is um, Missouri Alliance for Arts Education's definition for arts integration um, and how we're trying to uh, really just take that art form and take that content and teach them kind of together in, in unison um, and meet objectives in both. So in, the, in this warm up, for instance, we're using the art form of um, painting, and artistry, and we're connecting it to some social, emotional, conversational pieces and kind of building that community. So we're teaching both of those together um, as we get goals in both of those areas. 
Um, if you've been here before, you've seen this and I spent a lot of time on that warm up. So I'm going to just quickly brush over this. But, you know, this is just a quick overview of why we think it's so important. It's exactly what Phyllis said. It, it gives students um, an opportunity to join in and communicate and express in ways that maybe um, traditional teaching might not. And so it gives them that opportunity to be creative and take risks and learn from others. Um, and so we're just really big advocates for that here. We're ready to jump into our guest here today. Carrie is amazing. Um, and I'm gonna drive the ship here for her as she talks us through how she keeps it real. Um, I'm gonna go back one slide really quick, just because I wanna do her justice as I introduce. Carrie's in her 24th year of teaching. Um, she teaches visual arts at Maplewood Richmond Heights School District. During those 24 years, she spent time in the studio with students spanning from preschool through eighth grade. She currently serves as the Atilarista for pre-K through second grade at Middlewood Richmond Heights Early Childhood Center. She is a TAB teacher, which stands for Teaching for Artistic Behavior. And she's lucky enough to have attended the TAB Institute in Boston at Massachusetts College of Art and Design two times. Um, she has been using this pedagogical approach for over 15 years and facilitating high level creative thinking and beautiful artwork within a diverse student body. She's presented at the Midwest Educational Technology Conference, Fine Arts Regional Council, the big event for teachers at the St. Louis Art Museum, the National Art Education Association Conference, and numerous of Missouri State Visual Art Conferences. She's also a proud member of the St. Louis TAB Regional Professional Development Group that presents in conjunction with Missouri Alliance for Arts Education throughout the region. Um, please help me welcome Carrie as she talks to us about her experiences. Yay! Hi, everybody. Um, I was just talking before we got on here. I am not used to presenting virtually. <laughs> I like to be able to read the room, um, but it's hard for me to be able to see all of the little squares at the same time and see my slides and keep up with my notes. So um, if anybody uh, wants to ask questions or anything while we're chatting, um, please just shout, hey, Carrie, and I will slow down and stop and we can back up and look at those images a little longer or, um, you know, ask questions while I'm working through them. No, I am not offended by stopping. Um, go ahead, Lauren. Are you are you going to you're going to run the ship? Um, OK, so I do think it's important. Um, Lauren shared that I taught 15 years of middle school and now I'm uh, in an early childhood program. Um, I was lucky enough my first 15 years to teach three studio classes in the morning and then my entire afternoon was devoted to classroom teachers so my entire schedule was me teaming with whoever felt like they needed me I could jump into a science classroom for a week or two I could jump into a math classroom for a week or two I could jump into an English you know an ELA class it was whatever um, the building needed um, and that was my for my first 15 years of teaching um, I grew up as a constructivist teacher um, from a baby teacher on up for a very long time. So I was very lucky to have all of those experiences. So some of the stuff that I will share with you is a little bit older, um, but it's from my big kids and it's still, a lot of it's still really powerful work. And then I'll kind of circle back to my little kid work that I do now, because it's um, really different kinds of teaching, but it's still all integrated art, even social, emotional and arts integration. Um, it's all still the same work. It just looks different based on um, big bodies or little bodies. So go ahead. Um, I think all of us probably know our why. I think everybody's probably here because we already know our why, but um, it's, we know that kiddos can take those concrete subjects and make them, hey buddy, sorry, I have a kid wandering around. <laughs> can, you gotta go, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, please go, please go. We had this conversation already, so sorry. I was gonna take this call at school, but I had a doctor's appointment, so I had to come home. <laughs> um, kiddos really need a lot of different ways, to, a lot of different entry points to connect to content. So I, arts integration obviously is a great place for them to jump in. Um, I'm gonna talk a lot about play in a little bit. Um, I Play is uh, easily excused from schools these days, and there's so many powerful things that can come from play. So we'll get into a little bit of play, but everybody, you guys are here because you know your why. So 
we can keep going. Um, I think it's important that you guys know my lens. I have two different lenses that I live in. Um, I live through Reggio and I live through teaching for artistic behavior. Um, Reggio is, Reggio Amelia is a pedagogy from Italy and it's really about letting children lead the learning. Um, so that's what I'm doing with my little kids now. I came to TAB teaching for artistic behavior when I had big kids and it's this, it's, they're very parallel to each other. TAB is more of a way of um, guiding a studio classroom. Reggio is more of a way of being with children and allowing um, them to lead learning. So both are inherently uh, constructivist and help kiddos uh, connect to content. Um, so I'm having a hard time. I gotta move ya. I'm gonna close, I'm gonna close all the windows so I can't see faces. Okay. Um, so the principles of the Reggio approach are having the children be the active protagonists of their growth and development. Um, the hundred languages is really where I live. Uh, hundred languages is um, basically a metaphor for how children um, can accept information and how they can express their learning. So there's a really beautiful poem that I have on the next page that's all about the hundred languages, but it's really just kiddos um, being able to express themselves in a hundred different ways. And we know that there's more than a hundred, but that's what the poem is all about. And um, letting them express themselves through painting as a language or drawing as a language or dance as a language. Um, but it's really about um, how they can take in information and put out information. It's The space is a really big deal in Reggio. The space is your third teacher, um, constant professional development, constant documentation, constant research. Um, it's just a really beautiful way to teach. Reggio Children is the website. They're all linked. Uh, Lauren, am I going to share all of this? Yes, we will okay. send a follow-up email and we can link all of it. Okay, yeah, the Reggio Children is linked in the presentation so that you guys can go directly to the Reggio web website and um, read all about more, to get a little deeper into the process. I know we're not here to talk about Reggio, but I think it's important that everybody sees my lens so you understand how I work every day. Uh, go ahead and click there. So this is that part of that beautiful poem, The Hundred Languages, up there at the top in the blue. If you click on that, it takes you to the entire poem. But it's really just about the infinite ways that children have to explore and um, connect their learning. Go ahead. Um, there. So The Hundred Languages have, um, children have the ability to gain fluency in the language of art, turning uh, to using materials to express their ideas. Um, it's really about exploration and being part of the process. The process is huge. Um, tab, which we're going to click to in a second, is just about um, the child is the product. The art is not the product. The child is the product. So it's about thinking of that holistic approach for children. Um, children are always viewed as capable and as express, able to express themselves, and it gives um, multiple channels for them to be able to communicate. So the guiding principles of TAB, um, we call it the three-sentence curriculum. It's what do artists do? The child is the artist, and the classroom is the child's studio. Um, essentially, kiddos come into my room, the studio, every single day, and three-year-olds I see three-year-olds three to eight-year-olds every single day, and the studio is entirely theirs. I um, set up, I don't want to say centers, I don't like the word centers, but there's centers in my room for children to explore every single day. The child chooses what they want to do with their day. They go to that space, they set up their work area, they make, they talk about their work, we take pictures, we reflect on their work and then they clean up and leave. So it really is like a full-blown studio for little kids. So um, the also the, the tab is clickable. So if you wanna go and learn more about their process, um, Tab Inc is based in Boston. They've been around since the 60s, um, but they've really just in the last maybe 15-ish years developed a professional development program for people to attend to um, start to learn how to teach this way. 
Um, this is the full part of the We Believe statement for TAB. If you click on there, you'll be able to see the whole big thing, but it's really just about honoring the child as the artist and honoring their aesthetic. Um, I always like to say, get out of their way. They're gonna uncover the content and they're gonna uncover the material that you want them to learn. Um, you just have to provide the beautiful, safe and inspirational space for them to be able to do that. And they will access all of the things that you think that you need to lead them through. Um, you have to trust them to be capable and um, they're, they're going to find a way and they're going to get to the things that you wanna teach them. This little guy um, happened to be, this is his personal self-interest. He was really into space. Um, and I mean, he worked on this, talk about engage and persist. This child worked on this every day for months. So um, they, you know, they will uncover what you want them to uncover. I mean, this kiddo, just for me, went through um, all kinds of like resources, looking at space and reading about space and um, looking through images and coloring. And we talked about value and there were probably three or four of these pieces and they, they were massive. Um, so they will uncover the content. You just got to trust them. Um, so arts integration can be really simple or really complex. I'm going to show you different um, varying degrees of integrating art into content or integrating content into your art. Um, Lauren and I were chatting before we started. You really have to innovate with in and around your existing system to make things work. I am in a regular old urban public school district. So I have to still follow state standards. I still have to see children for a certain number of minutes each week. I still have to have lunch duty. I still have to have, I have to have all the things. So um, you have to get really creative about um, how you use your time and what you put out for children and how you organize your space for them. And um, I mean, you have to, you have to use with what you have to be able to, um, make things happen. So um, I know you're visual people. So yay, images. And so now I'm just going to story tell. <laughs> um, so this is probably the simplest form for me of arts integration. And this is just me being able to share my medium knowledge with another teacher. So this is a project from a really long time ago, where um, the kid, so I worked at an expeditionary learning and outward bound school. So we would take the kids to Tremont, Tennessee. We would go through the Smoky Mountains and we would look for salamanders in the rolling waters. And when we found them, we would try to identify them. So this is really me and kids using the dichotomous key for salamanders to identify them. And then we would build our sal salamanders based on the dichotomous key. So it's teaching the children how to use a scientific tool to be able to uh, determine a species, but also looking at the spacing between the legs and how long is the tail and what is the pattern. So it's all of those things, but it's really me supporting the science content with my knowledge of space and understanding of art concepts. And this is just salt dough. This is not anything fancy. This isn't anything, you know, that needs to go on a kiln. We, nobody knows needs to know how to do any of those things. This is just salt dough and me supporting a teacher in um, with my use of media, understanding of medium and how to talk to kids about how far the legs should be apart and how far the leg, eyes are apart and about the pattern. Um, but this, to me, this is like your simplest level of arts integration. Um, or... This is a science class that I took my content into. So um, this is the periodic table based on Louise Nevelson. So we talked about her as an assemblage artist and did all the art history stuff. And then uh, each child was assigned an element from the periodic table and they had to do all of their research on that element. And then they had to start to build um, assemblage boxes uh, in her style, and then we would hang them up in the order of the periodic table. Um, you can't see them, or maybe they weren't even on here yet, but each kiddo had to do um, a presentation like with a video, and those were all QR coded and linked into each box so the kiddo could explain what was in their box. 
um, and about their element and people could walk past and scan those so that they could watch the video with each kid explaining um, their element on the periodic table. So this is me going in and taking an artist to support the um, science learning. Also very simple though. And like this, this is super simple. Um, one of the other trips that we took when I had big kids was we would go to Dauphin Island, Alabama and we would do some uh, marine biology work. So this is just really simply me talking about kids, talking to kids about like a resist and what a resist is and then um, blending colors and which animals be get, belong at which depth and each color represents a different depth of the ocean. So this is again, just me supporting a teacher with um, my content knowledge of art and being able to say the darkest level is where these animals live. So this is just a um, really easy example of supporting a science teacher again. Uh, even scientific drawing, getting the kids outside and drawing what they see. Um, these are both images of kids doing sketches of things. The one on the left is our garden at school. And then the one on the right is the same, is off, also in Dauphin Island, Alabama, when we pulled out some squid <laughs> before dissection. So just scientific drawings and talking about shape and line and how far apart things are and our plants. Um, asymmetrical or are they symmetrical or are, are they alternating and so helping to identify the plants as well but I mean it can be that simple just supporting your classroom teachers with um, talking about line quality and stuff like that. Um, this is a little bit more complex this is a ELA project um, our whole eighth grade would read the book early uh, whirly gig and it was about this child who this terrible thing happened. I won't even go into all that, but he had to travel to the four corners of the United States and he planted whirly gigs about um, someone that was in his life. And whirly gigs are basically like, um, it's like folk art. And when the wind blows, they have a lot of motion to them. So as part of the culminating project for eighth grade, the team like science, math, com arts, um, who else is in there? Science, math, com arts. English, they all got together and they wanted um, to have each child have a whirly gig on the stage that represented a defining moment in their lives. So the book was all about this child's defining moment. So each child created a whirly gig. These are both very square. The other, I couldn't find a good crazy picture of a wild one, but um, each child created a whirly gig that um, was symbolic of their defining moment. And then the chapters of the book were like a wish, a motivation, a memory. So they had to write on their spinner things like their wish, their motivation, their memory, and um, an inspiration that they had. But they were also, they were charged with writing an essay and they were charged with making a video and they did all of this work around their personal defining moments. And then these were on the stage at their eighth grade promotion. So it was like, jumping out of the book and um, putting it into their own lives. Um, this is a really, we did this for comprehension for English language arts and the kiddos read out of the dust and each chapter, um, they had to break it down into details and really uh, try to process what was happening in each chapter of the book. And then, um, they were in groups and they drew these huge, massive, um, basically wall murals out of the dust, kind of, or not kind of, out of the dust was written about um, the same time as the WPA work. So I came in to talk about the WPA murals and the artists from that time and talk about their styling. And then um, each chapter of the books, the kids illustrated with uh, in a WPA style. So we talked about the social studies portion of it. We talked about the ELA part of it with the book. And then the kiddos drew each chapter of the book and all of the details and um, showed their comprehension through big murals by group. Uh, this was always one of my favorite, but I was always ready to pull my hair out by the end of it. Um, we talked about grid drawing and how to draw to scale. And we would talk about the different kinds of maps and, you know, if a map is flattened, what does that look like? 
and we would make a huge map on the social studies floor with painter's tape and we would label it by longitude and latitude and then we would roll out big pieces of butcher paper and the kids had to use the longitude and latitude lines like a scale grid so that they could draw out countries to scale and then we would put it up on the wall in the social studies rooms and they would use that the entire year to reference and pin um, all of the things that they were talking about in social studies. So again, using my content knowledge to be able to support um, the social studies learning. Um, so it doesn't all have to be just like com art science reading. Um, sometimes it's just about social emotional connection and dance and movement and um, I am lucky enough that I have a stage in my classroom so my kids use it um, all the time to story tell and we talk about having a beginning and a middle and an end and they um, come up with a plan every single day this is a choice for all of my kids every single day to use the stage and uh, they can have a five minute performance at the end of the day if they want. Um, but we talk a lot about um, what what does our expression look like and what does our emotion look like and how big do our movements have to be if we're trying to show the person in the back row and how clear does our voice need to be and how do we negotiate with the other characters in our story. Um, but it doesn't just have to be about the science, social studies, com arts, sometimes it's about um, getting along and telling a story and making up a performance. And so I'm lucky enough to have this stage in my studio every single day. Um, this is how I used to get to plan when I had big kids. We would talk about things over two years. So quarter one through four is seventh grade and then quarter five through eight was over eighth grade. And we would lay out the entire school year of units. So all of the math, math science, comma, art, social studies, health and PE, and then the expeditions, those are the traveling, um, the places that we would travel. We would lay out the entire two years, every two years, and we would align content and um, stuff that fit together. And then we would see what would overlap and what would teach, we could teach best together, like with an interdisciplinary focus. And then I would come in and we would build big full projects around grouping those content areas. So I was very lucky to be able to teach this way. Um, and I mean, it just makes sense. <laughs> um, this was one of our bigger projects every single year. This is our Metrolink project. It was an expedition. So the kids would go on a full day trip on the Metrolink. Um, every Metrolink stop in St. Louis has, well, almost everyone, We'll talk about that in a second, um, has a piece of art at it that represents the neighborhood. Um, so we would take every group, there was a whole bunch of groups, and they were all assigned a different Metrolink stop. They would ride to the stop, they would get off, they would look at the art, they would figure out how the art reflected the area, and then if an area maybe didn't have an art piece, why? And what social reason could that be reflecting? Um, we would talk about that. We would talk about the, we would do a land study. Was that, did that station displace people? Did that station after it was built, did it displace animals? So we would do some sort of a land study. We would survey the people on the train of how could they have gotten to work if they didn't have the Metro link. And we would figure out some social connections there. Um, trying to think of what else we did. Um, we did a lot of pre and post work for that trip, obviously. Um, and then when we got back, we would look at Romare Bearden's The Block, and they would have to create a collage in Romare's style using the images that they took when they got to their stop. And then we would connect all of the stops together, like a whole block of St. Louis. And they would have to write a poem about their stop and then they had to um, turn over their data for their scientific study. Oh, we would take timers on the train for math and we would figure out how long it took to get from stop to stop. So how fast our train was going. 
Um, so they would calculate speed for math. They would look at the social justice piece of the art that was there. They would look at the land survey for science, um, but we had it all wrapped together and it would start about a week before we went on the actual expedition and then probably another week after, but they would still have all of their core content areas. It was just all wrapped up in um, with a Metrolink focus. Um, so once, once I got switched to little kids, um, I started doing little expeditions with them. And this is one that's laid out by a whole second grade. I didn't know if the schedule would be important to you all, um, but I took the whole second grade to Lawmire for uh, a really long morning, kind of into the afternoon, we would eat lunch there. But um, it's kind of like broken down by times. Um, but they can still get their entire day of core content in um, by being thoughtful about their day. So like they could have their poetry unit there and we could be outside and we could reflect on the nature sounds to write our poetry. They did a scientific drawing unit with our seed to table teacher. Um, we have a seed to table is just like art, music, PE. Um, library counseling. It's just another special. We have a teacher who actually gardens and cooks with all of the classes every single week, but she did like a scientific drawing unit with them. We did a scavenger hunt um, on the property at Lawmire, and then we did the same scavenger hunt at school so that we could see what our the two different um, different areas looked like, us being a little bit more urban Lawmire being a little bit, you know, more wooded and talk about what we found there. And then we, while we were there, we looked at the art of Sam Falls. Um, that's the piece that you see there in the foreground. Uh, I wrote a grant. I think the next picture, yeah, the next picture is the finished piece that we did. So Sam Falls is an artist who, um, he's site specific. So he collects materials in the areas where he works and then uses them in his work. So when we got back, we collected materials from around our school and then brought them inside and pressed them in clay and made these four big, they're like big 20 pound pieces of clay and tile. Um, and we pressed our own, um, the things that we collected into clay to make our own site specific piece of work to represent our own community, just like Sam Falls represented his uh, so these kiddos, I love a stop motion video. Uh, these kiddos were involved in some Reggio work that was all about um, solving a problem in their community. And there they had to solve, they had to solve the problem themselves. So just with modeling clay, they all made themselves and they had to make short movies about solving the problem that they thought that they saw in their community. Um, and so they, with me, they made the little people and they made their background and we did the videos in the studio. And then with their classroom teacher, they wrote their scripts, they determined their problems, they determined how they were gonna solve them. So I teamed with their upstairs classroom teacher and then they um, had like a movie night and they celebrated um, with their families and showed how they were gonna solve the world's problems in 18 short videos. <laughs> Um, I also am very um, thoughtful about when I get different things out in the studio. So this is a light and color exploration, but um, I get it out during the time of year when kindergarten uh, is using my side and when they're doing their light and color and shadows unit for science. So it's basically just like a provocation or an invitation for them to come up onto, this is actually my stage. I take the clothes out of the stage for a couple of weeks because it can get a little bit darker in there. But I put all of those items out so that they can come up and they can explore the light and color items while they're talking about the light and color unit in their classroom. And I also make sure that I introduce artists that work in light and color during that time so that I'm just supporting the classroom teacher's work. I don't go into their classrooms. I don't um, do anything for them in their space. I just offer those extra opportunities in my own space. Uh, these kiddos were particularly interested in photography, which easy peasy, right? Um, but these are four and five-year-olds. This is a preschool class. 
Um, and they were particularly interested in photography. So I would take them on photo walks. We made pinhole cameras. We took apart cameras and looked at how cameras worked. Um, you know, which pieces do what, but it was really just an, inv an investigation of cameras and um, the conversation was hysterical. Uh, teaching them, I tried to teach them rules of photography, like leading lines. And um, they, they still though, what's cool is when you teach this way, they take the information when they need it. And so even though I could stand there and lecture about the rules of photography, they aren't going to use it until they need it. And I had some cameras out for some of my kiddos. Oh my gosh, three minutes. <laughs> I um, had some cameras out for my kiddos for some loose parts the other day. And they were using the rules that I had taught them as preschoolers in their loose part work with their cameras. So just the span that that has was just really, I, I just, I was shocked that they were still recalling those same, those same things. Um, okay, we can go really fast. Um, I have a rigamajig in my room. I don't know if anybody's familiar with a rigamajig. I had to write a grant to get it. That thing's like an $8,000 toy, um, but it's a, incredible for uh, STEM activities, STEAM activities, I guess. Um, but it's super fun. You can see they built all these little contraptions here, but we can talk about um, physics rules, you know, as a five-year-old and how physics works and how things move and how we put things together. Um, I'm trying to think of what I want you to go to. I guess keep clicking. Those are some more of my friends doing scientific drawings for a tile project. They were really interested in um, herbs. So we made tags for the garden so we could watch them grow. Those are my little guys. Uh, these friends are interested in bugs. So we did a lot of natural materials work and some photographing of their natural materials. Um, provocations, you can just, uh, it's a fancy word for putting out stuff for kids to engage with. <laughs> but if you are really thoughtful about what you put out, um, it encourages play and thinking and curiosity and building really beautiful spaces for kids. Um, keep going, keep going. Um, I actually, I had never seen that. Go back to that chart real quick. I had never seen anything written out like this, but I thought it was really thoughtful the way this person did this, that um, you can figure out your concept and then you can figure out different ways to present information to children for them to engage with it so that it's not just through worksheets. Um, I, I mean, obviously I know that, but I've never seen it laid out like this. So I thought that was really helpful for someone who's just entering this work. Loose parts are my jam. Um, I love being able to put out natural and um, collections of materials for them to build in. This particular friend, I had just talked about landscapes. So he's building a landscape through um, loose parts. That's what loose parts look like. Beautifully displayed equals more fun, better things. Those are my friends taking pictures of their landscapes that they're building with loose parts. Um, keep going. Um, I love loose parts so much I made them permanent one time. <laughs> You're not, they're supposed to be loose parts, so it's sort of an oxymoron. Um, storytelling through loose parts, uh, sequencing things, making number lines, uncovering standards. Again, even if you're leaving out a table of loose parts, you're totally uncovering standards without, you know, walking through them with kids. Um, keep going. I guess that's, we're pretty. Big kids, big kids need blocks too. Um, that's your uh, natural materials, making um, fun things with, uh, yeah, it is like giant Jingo. You're right, Phyllis. Um, Yes, uh, using natural materials to make your number line. Don't go buy one at the teacher store. Make it, engage them in that work. Um, these are good things to ask yourself when you're trying to figure out what your next step is um, to planning a project. But if we share all this with you, you can look at it. And a quick, I said I was gonna get to play. Yeah, quick shout out for play. Um, let them, you can keep going, let them lean in, let them play, let them experiment. And the 
the conversation that comes out is just incredible. Yeah, block play, measurement, shape, spatial relationships, right? Creative thought, expression, decision making, building confidence, uh, blocks, loose parts, all the things. Keep, we can keep going. Of course, everybody wants the 21st, 21st century skills. More play, dramatic arts in the room, pretending. I love pretending. I love listening to their conversations when they're pretending and scribing what they're saying and relaying that back to their, their classroom teacher is really fun. You also find out what they're interested in. And then I don't know what your breakouts are about. If I was coming up with an idea, this is what I was thinking. Anything that you saw here today that confirmed your thinking, extended your thinking, or challenged your thinking? Was that three minutes? <laughs> No, I'm so sorry to arrest you. Um, no, I I knew it was too much. I knew it was too much, but you know that you always have to go on too much. It was fantastic. And I, the, I think the thing that I kept hearing over and over, over again is just like the collaboration you have with the other educators in your school and working together with content teachers to help enhance the art side of things and vice versa. And so I think that's a really powerful message. Um, and yeah, you just have done some amazing things. So I'm leaving this up there. Please feel free to reach out to Carrie. I, she's fantastic. Um, and I will also share these slides with everybody. So take some time to kind of go through it at your own pace too. If anything seems more um, interesting and you want to follow up with it, feel free. Uh, you could reach out to myself or Carrie if you're comfortable with that. <laughs> um, and then these resources will all be linked in there. I'm going to go really quick to wrap things up. Next month, we're going to have um, Kayla Sandusky here doing creative movement to help with transitions. That will be November 27th. Um, I linked it in the email today, but it's also up on our website. If you wanna register for that, feel free to share it with friends and colleagues um, to build up our community. If you um, need or want a continuing ed certificate for your time today, please send me an email below. You can find me on the website as well. Um, we would love to get that to you. Uh, to, we really appreciate you spending an hour with us, a little more than an hour. Um, and then I'm gonna drop really quickly our um, survey link into the chat. If there's any topic or thing that you are super interested in, in coming to these sessions and learning more about or engaging with, please, please reach out to me. If you know of somebody that would be a great presenter, shoot me an email with their name and information. I would love to meet um, more like-minded arts integration people. And we will wrap it up there, Carrie. Thank you so much for your time and your wonderful expertise. Um, everybody, thank you for joining us and we'll see you in November.